Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Grand Round session. Um, I just am recognizing this podium does not go up and down. Can everybody see me okay? Yes. Hi. I'll reach around. Um, so this is actually, you might not know this, but this is a unique and special Grand Rounds as a once a year offering as a partnership between the Department of Psychiatry and the Corner Society. So I'll let my colleague, uh, Dr. Raz, tell us a little bit more about that. But I'm going to cover today's housekeeping items before turning it over to Michal for the introduction of our speaker. Um, for everybody who's here in the audience, I hope you're enjoying lunch. Uh, the only thing that I'm going to ask from you is that if you have questions or comments or feedback for our speaker, um, to please uh, jot them down or hold them in your heart so that at the end of today's session, we can spend some time in conversation with one another. For those of you who are with us on Zoom, please do feel free to enter those comments and questions really at any point in the presentation in the Q&A section of the chat. If it's something that I think I can answer and that I think I can answer accurately, I will do so at the time. If not, I will just put those in the queue for the moderated Q&A session at the conclusion. The last thing that I wanted to mention before we get started with our introduction <clears throat> is that at the conclusion of today's session, we will be inviting you to complete an evaluation. It will appear on the slide deck behind me for those of you who are here in the audience via a QR code. And uh, for those of you who are on Zoom will also appear on the slides as well as be sent in your email. I'm not watching the closed captioning, is it pretty accurate? Okay, awesome. Um, those uh, evaluations are critical for two things. One, and the most important, is to give feedback to our presenters on um, the impact of their presentations in our community, as well as to inform the Grand Rounds Committee for future planning as to the kinds of topics and presenters and presentations that are high yield. But the second, which may be important to many of you, is that you're able to get continuing education credit for attending these sessions. And as far as I know, all members of our uh, department community are eligible for credit upon completion of that evaluation. So thank you in advance for your feedback on that. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Michal. Uh, thanks everyone. I'm really happy to be here to introduce the speaker and also to kind of give a plug for this breakthrough grand rounds in, once, in which once a year we do a history of psychiatry. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Lee and to the Department of Psychiatry for sponsoring this and the belief that understanding some of where we're coming from helps map out where we're gonna go to. Uh, and that, there, that understanding the history of psychiatry is a crucial part of clinical practice. Uh, and I think I met some of you last year when I gave grand rounds here as part of the history of psychiatry crossover. Uh, I am a, my name is Michal Raz. I'm a professor of history and a clinical uh, professor of medicine where I'm just a practicing hospitalist. Sometimes I consult you guys when you're uh, when you're on, so thank you for that. Uh, and I run the Corner Society, which I inherited from Dr. Guttmacher, who's in the audience. The Corner Society is actually the longest running lecture series in the history of medicine in the country. It was founded in 1934, named after the professor of pathology, George Corner, who was one of the founders of this medical school and a big proponent of the importance of history. And we come together once a month to have talks about the history of medicine in general. And once a year, we have a set special session on the history of psychiatry, again, with the sponsorship of the psychiatry department. Our talk today is at 5.30 with Dr. Ramos on a different topic. So if you have time this afternoon, please plan on attending. All right. And, and thank you to Emily for organizing. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And now I'm going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Marco Ramos. Dr. Marco Ramos, MD, PhD is an assistant professor in history in the section for the history of medicine at Yale Medical School and also a practicing psychiatrist at Yale University. His research and teaching focus on the history of mental health with a particular emphasis on health activism, activism and the history of drugs and psychiatry in Latin America. He's currently writing a book uh, on Cold War violence and health justice in Argentina uh, and as he's wrapping up that project, he's looking at a new project on the history of psychedelics in the same region. Uh, apart from his own his historical rigor rigorous historical research, he's also a kind of a public intellectual and scholar who, who looks to bring the history of medicine and psychiatry, both to clinical practice and education, where he mentors and teaches residents, students, and undergraduate students at Yale. His writing has, writing has appeared in a bunch of different places, including clinical journals where you'd expect, um, academic, 
and also in public outlets, including, for instance, a, a well-received, slightly controversial piece in the Boston Review you may have seen. Um, his teaching brings a critical historical perspective to anti-racism interventions to science, medicine, and public health. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ramos, for coming out to speak to us today. Um, welcome you to the podium. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, McCall, for the generous introduction. I also wanted to thank the Department of Psychiatry for having me, in particular, uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Rosenberg for introducing this session, and also for to Emily and Mary Lee for arranging this wonderful visit. Um, I'm looking forward to the talk more, because I know what I'm going to say. I'm looking forward to your questions and the discussion uh, with the trainees afterward. Um, so let me skip through some of these slides get to the talk. Okay, so history of psychiatry as harm reduction. I'm going to try to stay close to this microphone, but I tend to like wander around when I'm speaking, but I'm pretty loud. So if you can't hear me in the back, just start to raise your hand and let me know. I should come back to the microphone. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a question that I get all the time, which is why are you a doctor and a historian at the same time? Like, you must have gone to school forever to do this. Like, why would you do this? Um, and so what I'm going to talk today is about why I see history as something that's really essential for medical practice and in particular medical training. And I'm just going to just state the sort of big idea for this talk right now, which is that if we don't understand the history of harm that our profession, psychiatry, has inflicted on marginalized groups, we're going to continue to perpetuate that harm, right? We need to know what we've done in the past to stop continuing perpetuating that sort of violence in the future. And I'm gonna unpack that, but I actually wanted to start with this video um, and I'm gonna shout, shout you out, <laughs> My, Myra Mathis, who I, I, I hope if you've had the pleasure of meeting here and who's a part of this community. Um, I worked with Myra and some other students to put together this conference at Yale called Reb Psych, or which was short for Rebellious Psychiatry, and was about the intersection of psychiatry and social justice. And we had this speaker come, who's an excellent, amazing journalist, definitely check out his work. His name's right up there, Michael Denzel Smith, who writes about a lot of things, but in particular on sort of black masculinity and mental health. Um, definitely check out his work. He was our keynote speaker. And this is just a short clip from the Q&A of his talk. And so I'm going to tell you about the question that was asked just to sort of set the stage that he's going to respond to. The question that was asked, someone raised their hand in the audience and said, look, like this is a conference on social justice, but we're all here, right? We all came to this social justice conference. We get it, right? This message doesn't need to be received by this audience who's already down, right? We need to get this message out to those psychiatrists who aren't at this conference. So that was the question that was asked or the comment that was posed to Michael Denzel Smith. And then I'm gonna let him answer. I'm gonna pick up on what like you said as an aside and sort of like a joke is like not the psychiatrist in this room. And it's like, no, that's, that's exactly it, right? Like it is like, not even sorry, it is you, right? Like, like I'm not, <laughs> and I say that like, because I have a good friend named uh, Darnell Moore whose book you should also pick up called No Ashes in the Fire, right? And um, several years ago when I met Darnell, we we're talking about these conversations around masculinity and like the black, black masculinity in particular and talking about that, they, the way that it intersects with white supremacy and talking about, and he had said something that at the time I just never thought of. Um, but now on, like sort of only use this as the framework of talking about specifically this thing, where he said, it's easy to recognize whose boot is on your neck. It is way harder to accept and recognize that your boot is also on someone else's neck, right? Like every one of us is complicit because every one of us draws some sense of power and privilege from a part of our identity. I stand before you as a cisgender heterosexual man, and I know that those first two, like all of that means that I experience some power and privilege that 
for much of my life has gone uninterrogated. And I'm constantly learning which parts of my behavior have been part and parcel of a system of oppression and which have denied other people access to their full humanity. I'm a part of that problem. And I have to take responsibility for that. And that is on me to examine that. It is, it is me to do that education and learn what the problem is, what I have done, and accept the, like, not only the responsibility, but the accountability. The accountability for repairing the harm. And so when you ask me this question, it is not about me even saying like what you've done wrong. It's like, there's literature letting you know what, what, what harm has been done. You know, like, hopefully, as prof like, you, hopefully that's part of the training, what, what's been done wrong. I don't, like, is it? Like, maybe, I don't know. I'm worried now, like, about the gaps in everyone's education here at Yale. Um, but it is, it is really about saying, no, the problem is not outside of me. The problem, I am part of a system, and I know that that system has been harmful, and I know that I, as a part of that system, am complicit in that harm. Now, how do I examine that? How do I fight back? And that's gonna look different for every institution that we're in, every identity marker that, we're, we, that we have, that's going to look different. But it is, is cru the crucial first part is to say, it's like, Stop abdicating the responsibility outside of yourself. It is to say, I am complicit in a system of oppression. Like, that's hard, and it's hard to accept, but that's the very first step. So I love uh, Michael's answer to that question for a lot of reasons. It's such a rich response. But one thing that I want to sort of focus in on is that moment where he starts to say he's worried, right? He's talking to them and he's like, y'all know the harm that psych you know, psychiatry's done to like my black community, other marginalized groups, y'all know that. And then he pauses and is like, wait a second, do y'all know that, right? Is that actually taught to you? Is that part of what it means to become a doctor in our society that you understand the harm that the profession of psychiatry and medicine as a whole has inflicted on marginalized groups? And then he gets really concerned. He starts to sweat because he's like, I don't think it is. And I want you to think about your training, right? Was, were there gaps in your education in the way that Michael is sort of laying out? And what might we do to the address those gaps? And we're not just addressing those gaps just to sort of, in a way, and this is why, I, again, I love this quote. We're not just doing it to say, you should feel bad about yourself because as a psychiatrist, psychiatry has harmed marginalized groups. It's to do better, right? If we're going to do better and not perpetuate violence and harm, we have to understand the violence and harm we've already perpetuated, right? That's the starting point. And so that's why I see history as an essential part of harm reduction in a clinical sense. The idea is understanding this history is going to allow us to prevent doing harm that afflicts in particular marginalized groups. And I'm gonna, this is sort of the big picture. We're gonna, get, we're gonna zoom down and get more specific throughout the talk. So the first half, I'm gonna talk about the history of harm reduction, um, uh, our history as harm reduction, specifically in some work that I'm doing in New Haven, Connecticut and around Yale University and the history of Yale University's relationship to the New Haven community. I've already been talking with some of the students in really interesting ways about the relationship between the University of Rochester in the surrounding communities. And it's just so amazing to see these are two different places, but also how much is similar and in common between sort of these academic relationships with surrounding communities. But then at the end, I think it's also important to acknowledge that while a lot of the history of psychiatry has to do with the violence and harm inflicted on marginalized groups, part of that history and often a history that's neglected is more liberatory visions of what mental health in psychiatry could be. And that's some of my own research focuses on liberation psychiatry in Latin America in its history, which is a, which is a sort of tradition that I see myself operating in clinically. And I can, I'm gonna talk more about that actually in the evening uh, corner talk, but I'll give you, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about 
that here as well. So the first thing that uh, Michael points out, he's like, y'all know the harm, there's literature. Like people have been studying the, the harm that psychiatry has inflicted on marginalized groups for decades. People have been devoting their careers to this for a long time. And the question is, why hasn't that knowledge that exists gotten into clinical spaces, which is a question I'll leave open, um, but just to point some of, some of the knowledge that's out there, this is a book that I highly suggest uh, y'all pick up if you don't know it, it's called Protest Psychosis. And it basically shows the way that academic psychiatrists in the United States in the 1970s pathologized black activism as a violent psychosis. And I'm gonna talk about the downstream consequences of that today. There's also this book, The New Jim Crow, um, that's about sort of the mass incarceration that's associated with substance use in the United States where people tend to get, particularly if you come from marginalized groups, and particularly if you're black and brown, tend to get criminalized, right, and put in the carceral system instead of getting treatment or access to care. And then there's this book from McCall Ross um, that's excellent that you should definitely check out, What's Wrong with the Poor, about psychiatry, race, and the war on poverty, where psychiatrists in many ways conceptualize black families as being essentially deprived culturally, socially, and materially which ultimately blamed, right, black families for the sort of structural oppression that they were suffering. And these things just aren't in the past. All of these different histories that I've just laid out have consequences for the present, right? For example, these were two studies that were done at Yale that, is, that show that both black and brown adults and children in emergency room settings, when they are in crisis, tend to get higher rates of physical and chemical restraint, regardless of the diagnosis, right? That association between sort of violence, agitation, psychosis, and in particular black men has to do with this earlier protest psychosis. This does not come from nowhere, right? It comes for, from a particular history that we need to understand and pair with epidemiological findings like this. We need to understand where these numbers come from. And that's what history can show us. So there's all this knowledge we have. There's all this research. There are historians, sociologists, anthropologists who have been doing this work for decades. You could even argue over a century. But that history does not appear anywhere. I went to uh, uh, medical school at Yale as well. It didn't appear anywhere in my training, right? The, the sort of history of harm that I'm talking about, we did get a few history lectures, but not in this vein. It doesn't make it into these spaces. And when it doesn't make it into these spaces, the sort of these harmful structures just end up reproducing themselves instead of people questioning them. And so I'm trying to push back against that in my role as a historian today. This, I just wanna give a, a brief shout out to this work we're doing as part of the social justice and health equi equity curriculum in the Department of Psychiatry. It's currently led by Dr. Carmen Black at Yale, who's amazing. She's the, the director of the program. You can see there are four different sort of prongs. Um, and this is a mandatory part of the curriculum. And that's the other thing I think is important. This cannot be a kind of elective Thing. The humanities and medicine for too long has been this sort of, let's make more well-rounded physicians who like to play classical instruments and read poetry on the side, right? And while like, okay, poetry and classical instruments can be great, um, this kind of knowledge needs to be, I think, a mandatory part of people's training. And this is. So um, there's structural competency, advocacy, human experience. And then I'm the director, along with Nathan Ha, who's also an MD, PhD in history at Columbia, of the history track, which whose goal is to teach this history of harm so that then the trainees can reflect, okay, am I perpetuating these harms that I've learned about historically in my own practice? Are structures that I'm working in perpetuating this harm? And if so, what can I do about it, right? Both at a policy level, if I wanna operate on that level and in sort of my day-to-day -day clinical interactions, right? When I see, for example, a black child put in chemical restraints or put in physical restraints for some particular reason. So I'm gonna give a little bit of example of some of the work that we do in the history of psychiatry track as part of, uh, we call it SJHE, the Social Justice and Health Equ Equity Curriculum. Um, and we've really focused in on teaching the local history 
of Yale psychiatry. And I think that's a particularly important perspective because the people that the trainees that I am caring for are in New Haven. And so understanding what it means for me to be a Yale psychiatrist working in New Haven, to do that work, the homework that Michael's talking about, right, that we have to do before we do this is knowing what does that label bring to the interaction, right? What sort of associations historically, how does the community understand and see Yale psychiatry, right? And how can that frame, right, in a clinical way, our interactions? So we've started focusing a lot on local history. And in particular, um, I've focused in on uh, the Connecticut Mental Health Center, which is a place the residents train. It's one of the community uh, mental health centers um, in New Haven. And we've uh, uh, discovered an archive in the center and begun to explore it. And I'm gonna share some of uh, what we've learned. One of the first things we learned is that the Connecticut Mental Health Center was actually um, uh, built on top of the homes of generally poor and black residents in New Haven. It was a process of redlining or urban renewal where the city, and th there's lots of scholarship on this, and, and um, I would endeavor to say this may, may be part of Rochester's history as well, because it was a sort of national movement. But cities and states began to say certain neighborhoods in our communities are a blight, right? Are, are, there's nothing good happening there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those homes, and on top of them, we're going to build state or academic institutions that are an improvement on what was there before. So that's how the state and academic institutions saw urban renewal. But from the perspective of the people who live there, they were getting displaced from their homes. And oftentimes without anywhere to go. So in some cases, the state would provide plans for them, but it, it literally ripped apart communities. If you see a highway going through the middle of a city, it's likely that that highway was built on these redlined areas that were blights to the city. They would say, you know what, this neighborhood, it's not worth anything anyway, let's build a highway through it. That'll be a better service to the public good. So just think about the fact that this place of healing that is supposed to be a Connecticut Mental Health Center, right? It's supposed to heal people, it's supposed to care for people. When it was established, it literally started with a sort of original trauma of displacing people from their homes. Specifically, we've discovered that the land uh, for the CMHC displaced 104 households and five small businesses in this mostly black neighborhood. And as I was just saying, this was part of the racist redlining effort that was designed to eradicate slums and make space for this Connecticut Mental Health Center, the Yale New Haven Hospital, where medical students train, and the Yale Medical School. This is one of the articles uh, from that period. And I won't go, I go into more detail if I give this talk in New Haven, um, but this is gonna look a little bit foreign, but this just shows some of the areas that were sort of redeveloped for the uh, Connecticut Mental Health Center. And you can see sort of what it looks like. So on the left, basically, you can see uh, the sort of residential and commercial property, that's the way it's zoned. And then on the right, you can see these massive institutions that are built on top of that in just a period of a few years as well as the Highway 34, the Oak Street connector. So this sort of framework for the CMHC coming onto to the scene in New Haven immediately and understandably created a kind of antagonism, right? Because the community remembered that their neighborhood had been torn apart by the building of this institution. But now you had Yale psychiatrists who were saying, come here and get your mental health care. And this immediately created a sort of antagonism. This is a quote from uh, Dr. Reiser, Morton Reiser, who was director of the CMHC in the late 1960s, who immediately said in this, in this internal memo, we have recently become very concerned that our relations with the community, in particular with the black and poor of New Haven, leave a great deal to be desired. So what did they do about that? They turned to this man, man, Mr. Fred Harris. Fred Harris was uh, one of the, the, arguably the most prominent community organizer and black activist in New Haven in the late 1960s. Um, there was an organization called the Hill Parents Association that worked with the Black Panthers in New Haven during this period. 
And Fred Harris was in many ways the most vocal and visible member of the Hill Parents Association. It was called that because the Hill neighborhood in New Haven is, is the neighborhood I was describing here. It's a mostly black uh, neighborhood in New Haven. So they have this problem, tensions with the community. This might sound familiar with like hashtag DEI right now as, a, as something that institutions do, right? This starts in the 60s where they say, we have a problem with the community. Let's find a community leader. Let's ask them to fix it for us, okay? So they go to Mr. Fred Harris and they say, help us out. He's named special assistant to the CMHC in 1969, and he's supposed to represent the interest of the community. And almost immediately, and we know this also because we're doing oral history with Fred Harris, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second, Harris was initially extremely cynical about the mission of CMHC, and he did not believe that the institution would actually help the community. He felt like Yale had other reasons outside of just helping his community for investing in community mental health. And we'll unpack that a little bit more. But Harris really like hits the ground running. And with the Hill Parents Association, he says, you're, you're calling this community mental health, but no one from the community is making the decisions about how care is provided, who gets to decide what kind of programming is involved, right? None of these are, are sort of front and center for the way you're doing community mental health. And so they made this list of demands. Um, and I'm not going to read them all. I'll just give you a second to sort of look over them. One thing I will note, though, when I give this lecture to people at the CMHC, many people feel like many of these demands still hold water today. So. The Hill Parents Association, Fred Harris, organize, they release these demands to the CMHC, and um, in response to those demands, um, the, the sort of director of the CMHC at the time is this man, Fritz Redlich, who was one of the prominent um, experts in community mental health in the late 1960s at Yale and nationally, um, and Redlich and Harris almost immediately get into at first, ver a verbal altercation, and then we discovered in this archive that they actually got into a physical fight, right? And what happened was that Harris put these demands in front of Redlick, and then and there are various accounts of what happened, and we're doing oral history to get uh, uh, Fred's uh, take on it as well. But from the archive, it seems like what happened, or, or one version of what happened, is that these demands were placed in front of Redlick, Redlick originally said that he was going to sign them and endorse them, and then that he kept taking his pen and sort of like waving it like he was going to sign and then pull it away and, and doing it over and over again. And this started to antagonize some of the community members in the room. Um, and regardless, something happened. It led to a physical altercation. Harris was accused of uh, actually choking Fritz Redlick. Um, and this led to Harris being fired from his position as community representative for the CMHC. Almost immediately, protests were launched um, in the community that demanded that Yale rehire Harris as their community leader. I'm gonna summarize this part very quickly just for the sake of time. But um, basically, after a lot of back and forth um, that was very tense, Yale said, okay, fine, you can have a community representative, anyone, it just can't be Harris. And we'll give you three weeks to figure out who, who, who you wanna nominate. They gave the community three weeks, the Hill Parents Association. After three weeks, Yale was like, who do you wanna nominate? And they were like, Fred Harris, obviously. So, um, and Yale does end up taking Fred Harris back. And that's its own story because Yale took him back but refused to pay him. Um, which, which is another an uncompensated labor with respect to DEI issues and community representation is still very much an issue at academic medical centers, but you can see its origins here. In any case, I'm gonna just take this one um, snippet of, this was one of the sort of uh, meetings with the community between the CMHC leadership, leadership who, were, who were Yale psychiatrists and uh, some of the community leaders. And Dr. Morton Reiser, um, who again at this time was director of CMHC says, quote, I think it isn't going to help to worry about what has been in the past. And what he means by that, he's referring specifically to this physical fight between Redlick and Harris. 
It so happens in that until somebody kicks me out, I'm chairman of the department and director of the center. And I think that my views about these things were no secret. You know, I'm not a gung-ho social activist. I wasn't brought here because I made my reputation as a community psychiatrist, which is weird because it's a community mental health center and supposed to be one of the leading ones in the country. So why is someone who's leading this organization, right? Not a community psychiatrist, not really interested in social actions or activism or community relations. And the reason, and this is what the Hill Parents Association and Fred Harris thought as they learned more about how Yale psychiatrists operate was that what they were actually interested in was research on the community, right? It was less care provided to the community and more using New Haven. And this is a quote from one of the internal mem memos as a laboratory for publishing papers and doing research. I'm gonna highlight just one of the studies that was published during this period. This was arguably the largest and most high impact study. It, it came out as this book uh, with August Hollingshead, who was a sociologist and Fritz Redlich, who I mentioned before, um, was very, at various times the Dean of the, the Medical School and Director of CMHC. And Dr. Ray, uh, Redlich's famous study basically divided New Haven sociologically and in health terms into what he called five classes. Class one were the elite of New Haven. They were people with a high level of education. They were employed. And not only that, there was also a sort of racialized dimension where that class one individuals could trace their lineage, right, back to the original white settlers of the Connecticut region. Most of the people who belong, belonged in this class were um, oftentimes Yale professors themselves. Um, so that's class one. Class five were the poor unemployed of New Haven who tended, again, he spells this out specifically, who tended to trace their lineage back to uh, either more recent immigration in the case of uh, Caribbean immigrants or back to descendants of slavery. Um, and so you had these five classes that they lay out. The reason these classes were important clinically, Redlich argued, was because you always had to put the behavior of people within the context of the class in which they were situated. And so he argued that class five adults culturally, right, were inclined to physical violence. And so, and this is quote, uh, quotes from the, the study, if you had a class five adult, quote, beating his wife, that should be seen differently because that was, that is quote unquote, acceptable for that culture versus a class one adult where you might not expect that. He also argued things like class five adults, for those of you who are into psychoanalysis, had um, deficient uh, super egos, which you could sort of think of as like moral, your moral conscience, right? Like their, their morality was somehow um, impacted. So, and this study in particular is what a lot of these activists during this period say Yale is actually interested in, right? It's doing research like this. It's using New Haven as a laboratory, not as a society to promote healing and care. I could go on about this for the next hour. I'm gonna cut it here. But one thing I want to, and if people have questions, please reach out to me, because um, this is a very active area of research for me. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is that these tensions, this history has created immense tension between the community and the CMHC that happens even today. And this really a flashpoint recently when I was a trainee was uh, that Yale uh, uh, Department of Psychiatry and the CMHC wanted to put TSA style metal de detectors at the front of this outpatient primary mental health care clinic. And uh, a lot of the, the, the community members felt like this made them feel incredibly uncomfortable. When you walk into CMHC today, you're met by two uniformed officers, right? Who look like cops. They're not technically cops. They don't have guns on their hips, but there are guns downstairs that they can go run into and unlock. But they look, they, they read as cops, right? They have, they have officers. And then they take your belongings. They put them through this TSA style metal detector. You're often wanded when you walk through it. And this is your introduction to the place where you're supposed to get healing, right? Where you're supposed to get care. 
And it feels like in the minds of a lot of community members, more like a carceral institution, right? Contrast that with the building across the street, which is Yale New Haven Hospital and tends to treat people who get private insurance. When you walk into that lobby, you're greeted with a waterfall and someone playing the piano and someone there to tell, help you help sort of navigate your visit, right? This is literally across the street from each other. So these tensions, and there's been organizing against these metal detectors, again, happy to talk about this more. But where I started was sort of how do you use this for education? So we're using this in the history of psychiatry track, stories like this to actually teach the psychiatry residents today about the history of the community, because they're coming from all different parts of the country and sometimes the world. So what we're trying to do is orient them to the institution that they're a part of into the community that they're serving before they go out into it and provide care. And there's been a number of takeaways. One thing that has, has come out really strongly is that a lot of the, uh, or several of the trainees said, initially when people miss, I, I picked up on some degree of mistrust in my clinical interactions, I assumed it was a lack of health literacy. I assumed that there was some sort of ignorance with respect to how mental health can help this individual. But now that I've learned this history, I've learned that this sort of mistrust and suspicion is legitimate and historically grounded, right? So rather than gaslighting people by saying they're ignorant for not trusting Yale psychiatrists, this history has allowed people to say, wait, there's like a legitimate historical basis for this. And that knowledge can create different kinds of conversations with your patients about what it feels like to come to an institution like that when, for example, they had a parent who was involuntarily confined at Yale Psychiatric Hospital. What does it feel like then to come to Yale? You can talk about that, but you can't be open to that kind of conversation if you don't know this history, because it's just gonna fly over your head. And at worst, you'll, you'll sort of feel like the patient is ignorant or not health literate. The next is that community-based research can be and often has been exploitative. I feel like we often attach community in front of things to make it seem like more expansive, socially just, et cetera. But we should, the, these sorts of narratives have made a lot of the trainees start to think about their own research projects in New Haven, right? And to think more critically about how they engage and role and allow for the participation of community members in their research. And I'm happy to talk about community-based participatory research. I don't do it, but I think a lot about it and its ethics. And this is the big takeaway is that harm can happen in the name of healing. We go into this profession to help people and that's wonderful, right? But we need to know that harm has happened and is continuing to happen in the name of healing. Just because we're doctors and providing care doesn't mean we're insulated from harming people. And the last thing I wanted to say is that this is the other thing that's come out of this that I didn't anticipate as much is that all of a sudden, a lot of trainees want to do historical research, right? Traditionally, when you think about research in academic psychiatric centers, it tends to be like neuro, neuroscience, right? Or it tends to be psychiatric epidemiology. But as I've started to teach more about this, people are interested not just in the biological, but also in the political the social, the cultural aspects of mental health. And so we've started working on an oral history project and actually one of my students um, tracked down Fred Harris, right? And so we've actually started doing oral history interviews with Mr. Harris. We're inviting him to New Haven. Fritz Redlich has a bust at the front of CMHC. We've asked Yale to make a bust of Harris. So far they have refused, <laughs> which probably isn't surprising. But um, we're going to have an event, and it started to make us think more about how can we use oral history in the community, not just to teach this, but also to learn more about what's happened, right? What stories ha do we not have, right? And that this, this, is, this is its own kind of knowledge production, just like we have other sorts of knowledge production in sci academic psychiatry. Okay, so I'm going to talk relatively quickly about my, the other side of my research, which is not looking necessarily at history as a, a vehicle, or I'm sorry, psychiatry as a vehicle for harming patients, but looking at sort of um, history as a resource for imagining more just forms of psychiatry, right? We have lots of examples from the past as well 
of practitioners and patients who have come together and have seen the problems with the kind of traditional medicine and psychiatry that I've laid out and have tried to imagine more just ways of providing healthcare. Alondra Nelson's work, if you haven't checked it out, on the uh, health activism in the Black Panthers is a great example of this. The work that I do is looking at liberation psychiatry in Latin America. And before diving into it, I wanted to share that, again, sort of my interest in liberation psychiatry actually came from my clinical experiences. Um, this was me as a medical student um, with Michelle Silva and Andres Barquillo-Teo. Um, he works at the UN. She works at the Hispanic Clinic, actually, in the CMHC. Um, and we partnered together to work in this free clinic in Fairhaven, which serves uh, mostly um, Spanish-speaking undocumented immigrants without insurance. And I was, as I was working there as a medical student, I, I saw a lot of psychological distress. But when I initially entered this clinic, there was no mental health program. So that's why I partnered with Michelle and Andres. We made a, uh, a mental health program. It was very sort of some ways basic. It provided sort of psychoeducation about the depression, anxiety. Uh, it still exists today. It's been going on for about 10 years. Now they like prescribe medication and SSRIs um, and treat mostly sort of uh, moderate depression, anxiety. If it's beyond that, they usually try to refer out to someone else. But we were able to provide some sort of service. And initially I was pleased with this. Like there was this need, we created this program, we're addressing it. But almost immediately when I started actually providing care, I became really frustrated. And the reason was, is that people would come in psychological distress that was related to larger social, political, and cultural factors. They had to do with the fact, for example, that they'd come to the United States to make a living, and in many cases, to send money back to their families that were struggling in their home countries. They would get there here, and they couldn't find work, much for themselves, much less for their families back home. This was extremely demoralizing. In addition to that, many of them didn't speak English. And so there were all sorts of everyday experiences of racism that were shared along those lines living in New Haven. On top of that, and this is well documented by some of the excellent journalism in, in Fairhaven, um, there was specific police targeting of Spanish speaking immigrants in this community during this period where they would just drive around and sort of harass Spanish speaking people who couldn't be able to understand them because they weren't speaking their language. People talked about social isolation, et cetera, with the immigrant process. So it just felt weird with someone coming in with a story like that. And then I'm like, here's an SSRI. Because how is that going to affect these larger root causes of their psychological and social distress, right? It's this sort of band-aid and at that an inadequate one, it felt like for these larger issues. And I started thinking about like, could you imagine a healthcare provider that not just provided the care for the patient in front of you at a one-on-one -on -one level, right? To heal and support that person, but that could also address these larger structural root causes, right? As part of healthcare. Because otherwise it just feels silly almost. And I was like, medical school would teach me how to do that. Nope. So medical school, at least when I was taking it, did not provide a, any sort of robust education on advocacy and activism or the politics of health. That's actually what pushed me into history and studying the history of health activism and looking to the past as a way for trying to find more structurally engaged and liberatory forms of mental health care. And I ended up going to Argentina um, partly because Argentina, may, you, you may not realize this, but it actually has more mental health professionals per capita than any country in the world. It's a deeply psychological and psychoanalytic in particular culture. And it also has a robust history of political activism. And so I looked at this case of Argentina and Chile and in the sort of this region in general, the Southern Cone in South America, as a way of exploring what happened when you had this like real revolutionary political activism and this deep psychological culture, like do we have examples of sort of politically engaged mental health care during this period? And I find there, there is a, uh, a robust history here. Um, specifically in 1969, where I'm gonna start just telling you a little bit about this, um, there was this massive political uprising against a really violent dictatorship that was actually supported by the United States. And it was supported by the United States because they believed this far-right violent 
military dictatorship would stop the spread of communism in the 1970s. So you had this uh, very violent dictatorship um, that emerged in the late 1960s under General Juan Carlos Onganilla. And in response to that, you had this massive sort of political mo mo uh, mobilization. And there was one in particular uh, uh, protest in the city of Cordoba. Um, this ended up being called the Cordoba, and still is the Cordobaso, because if, uh, in, in sort of affectionate terms, as a way of sort of marking this like massive uprising that happened in Cordoba. And so this was happening in the political world, but in the psychological world, Mari Langer, who was a leftist psychoanalyst during the period, said that this political mo mobilization woke us up, right? We as an institution, the sort of practice of psychiatry in the, in the country awakened to this political reality and realized that, and this was the, the manifesto of the group that she started, which was called Plataforma. Plataforma broke away from the sort of um, traditional conservative um, psychiatric association in Argentina, which you can sort of think of as the APA here. So Plataforma breaks away and they break away specifically because they're saying, we're going to reject that sort of neutral psychiatry that we've been taught. And instead as scientists and professionals, we're going to put our knowledge at the service of the ideologies that question without compromise the system in our country that exploits the oppressed classes. What this looked like theoretically, I'm gonna give a, talk a little about theory and then talk about like sort of practically clinically, what did this mean? Is that um, there, there was an effort to bring sort of Freud's understanding of psychiatric care in a one on one setting, right, healthcare, together with this larger Marxist structural critique, right? So, if, how can we bring together exactly what I was talking about in, in my clinic in Fairhaven, this larger structural critique and mobilization together with the care of the individual? And what they end up sort of landing on is, is what they call uh, liberation psychiatry. And liberation psychiatry, I think of less as a set of um, prescriptive guidelines. And I was talking about this with the students because what you do in your local political situation is gonna vary depending on what the on the ground sort of politics of the set, site you're operating in. But it's more of a framework or a spirit or a mindset um, that sees mental health as something that requires liberation from the societal structures that psychologically oppress you. And that's such a basic idea. But the idea is that you can't be mentally healthy until you're liberated from the things that are harming your mental health. And so this has dramatic consequences for yourself for, as a practitioner, right? It means I treat the person in front of me, but I'm also responsible for and accountable to the social structures, the political structures that are harming them, that are psychogenic, right? I'm sorry, pathogenic. So this liberation um, mindset leads to the formation of new training centers. And I think about all this, all, I think about this all the time as I'm sort of working in the sort of education space with academic psychiatry today. But they form what's called the CDI or the uh, Centro de Documentación y Investigación or the Center for Teaching and Learning. And it's different than any of the medical schools that have previously existed or the psychiatry programs because it has three areas. The first area is essentially just a political education. Like it has nothing to do with specifically clinical care. The second area is the clinical care. And then the third area is how do you take this political knowledge, this clinical knowledge and put it together through action in the world. And these are the sort of three areas. And I always think about this political education area having as much space as the clinical education area because both of these were so essential. Similar thing happened actually with Black Panther health activism where physicians um, were required actually to work with the Panthers to have a political uh, education. I'm gonna give one example, particularly of this like uh, area three, like what did the political action look like among these psychoanalysts. And there was this one study that was published in this leftist journal, Los Libros, in um, 1974. And it was these uh, two psychoanalysts, one of whom I've had the pleasure of meeting and talking to, um, uh, Hugo Besetti and Guillermo Pesni, who were uh, psychiatrists who, who um, uh, 
uh, or psychoanalyst who learned at the CDI that I just mentioned. And as part of Area 3, they did this research study where they went into the, this um, US sort of sponsored uh, factory in Argentina that makes uh, like home goods. And they went into this factory um, and they were sponsored by the communist party there. And they worked with labor organizers to set up these groups within the factory. And they essentially met with people and they talked to them about a lot of the um, oppression that they were feeling, the burnout that they were experiencing as part of their job in the factory. And in many ways, in that respect, it was a more or less traditional psychosocial group therapy practice, right? What is going on in this factory, learning about that, and then providing support for each other. The part of it that really connects with liberation had to do with like, okay, we're supporting each other in this way. Now, how can we work together to modify the reality that is harming you psychologically? These groups were not just designed to describe the violence that was happening in the factory. They were designed to modify the reality that was violent, right? And as part of the same activity, we go from talking about group therapy to people saying, okay, like, well, if this is a big problem, the fact that they don't give us any time to go to the bathroom, which was a big issue for them, then like, what are we going to do about it? And it, it naturally sort of flowed because this is the liberatory framework that they had into political action and organization. This is a quote from one of the workers who participated in this study. What is new in this research is the chance for the standard electric workers to see a new type of science that is different from the science that serves our bosses. The science that serves their bosses, psychologists have been in factories for years, but they've been there mostly um, to increase productivity and efficiency. So they would use these psychometric tests on like, for example, prospective um, applicants to jobs and they would say, oh, this person has the skills that matches the job set. And so they, they, these workers were familiar with, with psychologists in the workplace, but they were psychologists in the past who had served their bosses, right? So what they were seeing that was new in this research was a science that can help the working class to see more clearly the condition and situation in which they live. Around that reality, we can construct together a new science that fundamentally aids the revolutionary process helps deepen the level of consciousness of factory workers and connect scientists themselves with concrete reality. In other words, just to reiterate this point, the goal is not only to describe the violence in the setting, but it's to raise a kind of political consciousness and awareness that empowers you to act with your health practitioners, right? In solidarity with your health practitioners against the pathogenic reality in which you live. One finding that came for this that I think is so important is that we talk about sort of, uh, you can be healthy by like taking down these pathogenic structures in the world that are harming you. But they also discovered that activism itself was psychologically therapeutic for the people involved in political organizing because there was something empowering about speaking back to the things that are harming you, right? And if, if any of you have engaged in political organizing, you may have experienced this itself. It can be exhausting in many ways, but there's also something about it that allows you to feel like, at least I'm doing something against the things that are trying to hurt me, right? And, sometimes, and then and, and in certain cases, there, there's success there. This has just recently started to, to, to like crop up in American medicine in very small ways, certainly not in this like robust, institution building way that we saw during this brief period in Argentina in the 1970s. But this is uh, from Leo Eisenstein um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, who said, you know, we talk about burnout all the time. We talk about wellness. Instead of prescribing like additional things for us to do to be well, like in addition to all the hours you work, go to yoga, do these sort of things like hashtag self-care. Part of what we need to do is actually organize against the, the structural conditions that are making our lives and our jobs more miserable than they need to be. And that there's something about that that treats burnout because there's a, an, an empowerment there. Everything I've just described only existed for a few years in Argentina. It came crashing down with the rise of this military dictatorship of Jorge Rafael Videla. And in fact, I only know 
about a lot of this history because of this man. This was a psychoanalyst who was secretary general of the largest openly revolutionary psychiatric organization in the country in the 1970s. His name's Emiliano Galende. And in 2014, he shared this duffel bag with me. During the dictatorship, his organization was targeted for being openly revolutionary explicitly by this violent military coup. And so he took all the documents because he was secretary general, stuffed them into two duffel bags, took his leather duffel bags and fled the country. He came back after the return of democracy and hid these duffel bags in his basement. It was only like in our seventh or eighth meeting when he, we had developed a kind of rapport that he said, hey, I've got something for you. And he went down and came up with these duffel bags that are filled with all the official papers of this revolutionary organization that I was, again, I will say was the largest psychiatric organization in the country, right? APA level organization. So when I thought to Argent I went to Argentina, I was gonna work in archives like this, state archives, right? That are sort of the archives that we're familiar with if you're a historian. Um, but these state archives don't have this liberatory history of psychiatry because it was repressed. It's in people's basements, in people's homes that these, these elder activists has held on to these documents from the past. And I, so I think about my work increasingly in terms of this photographic installation by this artist, Marcelo Brodsky. And he was talking to an activist, an elder activist from this period uh, in the 1990s. So this is after the return of democracy. And they're talking and she's remembering this period that she sort of had repressed psychologically. And she was like, oh my God, during this period, I remembered I buried books in my backyard because I was afraid someone would report that I had these Marxist texts right on my shelves. And this actually wasn't uncommon. People burned their own books so the military wouldn't find them. They dumped them in trash cans, but she buried them in her backyard. And Brodsky said, why don't we go dig up the books? And so she got her two sons and they found the books buried between two fig trees. And he sort of documented, it, it looks very forensic. It's almost like a forensic human rights, like sort of um, uh, uh, a disinternment of, of bodies, which also happens in the country. It has that feel to it. It's this archeological excavation, right, of these books. And what Brodsky asked is, what does it mean to take these liberatory ideas that were repressed in the past and dig them up and bring them into our consciousness today? How can we use these ideas that were pressed in the past as a way for imagining more just futures? And this is increasingly how I see history, as I was saying, as a resource for liberation. Okay, so these are two ways in which I've sort of laid out that I think history is so important for how we think about psychiatric practice. I'd love, I, are we over time? Okay, sorry. So no questions, but please come up. I'm going to be here all day. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramos, for a, a very thought-provoking discussion. Um, I know that if you are lucky enough to be a trainee in our department, you will also have some time with our speaker. So lucky you. If you're not, sorry, but if you'd like to stay, we'd be happy to have you. Otherwise, um, if you're staying for the Q&A session um, with our speaker, please go ahead and move down. And for anyone else, there are other events throughout the course of Dr. Ramos's visit. And if you would like to connect with him, I encourage you to do so. Thank you.